sent them a request that said, I want to see all your documents pertaining to a whole bunch of things for the last five years. And it took them some months to respond, but in fact, in January, I did get a response. I got a CD back, which had a compilation of any number of documents from the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. And I thought you would be interested to know what they said. Since 2004, and for the five fiscal years after that, the counties, the four western counties, have received over $30 million in homeland security money distributed through FEMA. Now, under the statute, 25% of those funds have to be dedicated towards terrorism prevention planning, organization, training, and equipment. Now, breathe easy for about a half a minute, and then it gets bad, okay? Uh, what you can breathe easy about is what the information we receive shows is that a lot of the money has been used for first responder communication equipment, first responder protection, critical infrastructure, and pandemic preparation. No problem. However, we also know that some of the funding, and specifically $2 million in 2005 in Western Massachusetts, was specifically targeted for information and intelligence sharing. And the report shows that although the money was distributed for that purpose, we don't know exactly what it was spent on yet. Now, there were a couple of different phases of how the money was spent. I don't want to concern myself with what happens. There's a program involving reporting uh, to police departments of inmates who were released from the Hamden County House of Correction. But I would like to talk about the second phase for a minute because there was a memorandum of agreement signed by virtually all of the local police departments. And that memorandum of agreement says that there will be instantaneous exchange of information relating to various criminal activity. There will be appropriate exchange of information regarding criminal investigations and, you can stop breathing easy, sharing of timely information regarding sensitive matters related to Homeland Security, which, by the way, is an amorphous criterion that can encompass any kind of suspicious activity. So, there's this agreement between the various police departments in the four western counties that they are going to share information. And what we don't have yet from this data is what information is being shared from local police departments to the Massachusetts fusion centers. The fusion centers should be more properly called surveillance centers. There are, I think, a hundred plus in the United States now. There are a couple in Massachusetts. And the federal government calls them fusion center because they fuse information. They are, in fact, surveillance centers because they collect information and data and surveillance and they put it together. It comes from two different sources. It, the information comes directly from local state and local police, as well as from private corporations, credit card companies, your airlines, your Visa card, your toll booth records using uh, the mass bike, an easy pass, and anything else you do that is electronic that comes from your computer where you buy something, communicate with someone, or otherwise utilize almost any program you have, including from those various platforms that we have so much fun carrying around in our pockets. Now, the information also comes from databases that are available to the federal government, and then they fuse this information. They also get something else. They get something called SARS, S-A-R, SARS, Suspicious Activity Reports. This is raw data provided by local police departments to the fusion centers, or in the instance of this Western Massachusetts collective, law enforcement collective, that is just data. It's a suspicious activity report. Someone says, that person's suspicious. I saw that person being doing something that made me very nervous. And that data, once entered, never leaves. So the suspicious activity reports, the SARS, can be completely wrong. They can be having you doing something that you is not suspicious at all. It's First Amendment protected. It's within your rights as a person to do. Absolutely legal. And that report will follow you in a job search, 
in an application for a law enforcement app, uh, license of some sort, perhaps, for the rest of your life. And oh, by the way, then it will be distributed to 30 or 50 or 100 other agencies that will take the same wrong information about you and pass it on as if it's true. There's no criteria which governs how SARS are used, when they're implemented, or why they're implemented. So, there is, by the way, and we did this at another community forum, a bill pending in Massachusetts to give the legislature and the governor some oversight of the fusion centers in Massachusetts. Want to do something productive, work on passage of that bill. So, where are we now with regard to local law enforcement and surveilling you? And the answer to that is we don't quite know. We do know that there is a, an agreement between local law enforcement. We don't know how much of that information goes to the fusion centers, the surveillance centers, and we don't know how much information or how often information comes back from the surveillance centers. I do intend to, create, to write some more public records requests to local departments to see what data we can secure about that. I'd like to end with what I think is a crucial point here in terms of protecting our privacy. We live in an information age where data is shared in a nanosecond. And that information can be right or wrong or biased or inaccurate, racist, motivated perhaps by political considerations or personal animus or vendettas. And once that information is in a database, it never comes out. It is crucial to work on the gatekeeping aspect of what information about you goes into the law enforcement and terrorism databases, which are, by the way, now merged in the fusion centers. The fusion centers were supposed to be about terrorism and preventing terrorism. Well, there didn't seem to be enough to do, so now it's law enforcement. Well, that didn't be enough to do, so now it's anything suspicious. So now it's anything that any government law enforcement agency wants to put together and compile data about us. The initial gatekeeping function is crucial because the garbage that goes in in the beginning will stay with you for a lifetime. And therefore, it is important that our local law enforcement agencies, and I make absolutely no accusations that any of them are doing any of this, we will try to find out who is doing what. But it is crucial that, that our local law enforcement not be part of this problem, and that rather it be part of the solution. And that it not be used, that local law enforcement not be used to put data and collect data about us that can be inaccurate and wrong, and which is, by and large, going to be protected First Amendment activity for you to stand on the street corner or stand in a demonstration and to hold the sign and express yourself politically and to go to this meeting and not have it end up as part of your file. Mine's hopeless. It doesn't matter. Forget me. But your file should please. Let's protect everybody else. Look, the stakes here are big. There's no question about that. It's not just that your privacy is, will be lost or can be lost today, because the privacy, if we lose it on a local level, and we lose it across the state on a local level, there is a privacy right that we will never regain because the technology never gives it back. Thank you. So first we're going to hear from our two remaining panelists, and then we're going to open up for question and answer. Also, Jeff Napolitano from the American Friends Service Committee is going to be joining the panel to answer questions 
to answer any questions you may have about the campaign and local legislation around the campaign. Um, after, first we're going to hear from Hazel Dardano and then Rich Hernandez, and then as people have questions, we're going to take questions up here at the mic so we can create a little line up here. Great, so I'm going to turn it over to Hazel. Thank you. Hi, how are you? I'm glad to be here, and I hope you will be able to understand my English. Mm -hmm. I think that I have very strong accent now. <laughs> well, I've been working for helping immigrants. I am an immigrant, you know. I come to this country with a student visa, but I was able to fix me, my paper when the law for 1982, that they say everybody that come before 1982, they can fix paper, and that's just the way that I did. And the, the funny thing was, in that moment, you know, I always keep my student visa, but it was very easy to come to this country to get the social security. I remember that I went to the, to the building, uh, the city hall building with my passport from El Salvador, fill it up paper, and I say, they say to me, you're going to receive your social security in two weeks, and that will happen by mail. I went to the police station with my license from El Salvador. I just get there through the test through the computer, same question, and they give me my license from here. That was the easy way to, everything was. Then I went to the school to learn English. Then a few months later, I started to work in a restaurant, you know, to make some money to help my, my parents because the situation in Salvador was when we started the civil war for 13 years. And then I was working, you know, but I still went to the school because I went to the New England School for Acupuncture to learn acupuncture. And I was legal by that time, you know, and I was keep my student visa. But I was working and paying taxes every year. What happened when the, the law come, that they said everybody that come before 1982 will be right to fix it up his paper. Then I went there, and then because the church put people to fill it up paper without pay, you know, free. Then I go and talk with the guy, and the guy say to me, I don't see so you can fix the paper because you don't qualify for this law. I say, how come? Well, because you are not illegal, you have a student visa. And I say, how come I've been working in this country, paying taxes every year, and now you tell me that I cannot fix a paper? I say, wait a minute. You have been working in this country? Yes. I have a social security that I receive when I come. And I say, oh, you was not allowed to work. That put me in the legal situation, and that's the way that I fix my paper. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how stupid is the law, you know. Now, <laughs> now if you are illegal, this is a punish. Now you have, you know what I find out two or three days ago? I have a friend of mine because every time that I find out that something that they can do, I tell them to do that in the way to fix paper. And I, I went from ADP that they bring a lawyer and I went to, the, to all the information that this lawyer is giving to us, you know, about how people can fix paper. And then, you know, because when I was working in Catholic Charities, we have an office that works for immigration, for immigrants. And then, you know, they say to them, every time that, that somebody gets married, you know, before you get married with American citizen and you can fix your paper without problem. Now, if you don't have the I-94, you have to come back to your country. And they tell you to you, you can be there one year, two years, five years, ten years, waiting for the, for the resident to come to you and come back for your husband or for your wife and your kid. It means like if you're American citizen, I'm married with woman that is illegal here, and don't, if she has the I-94, come with the tourist visa and stay in this country, and it's illegal now, with this I-94, she can fix the paper without move from this country. But if you come illegal and doesn't have the I-94, you have to come back. And you have to pay a lot of money, you know, to the lawyers over here to bring the wife back or the husband back. Because that, that case happened in, in, in our church in Amherst. The lawyer told the lady, you know, it's better you go. The father, before Kennedy died, Father Brennan was to, what, went to Boston to talk with him to try to help to bring this woman back. Because she back to El Salvador with three kids. They had to pay all this ticket in the plane to go back. Finally, two years later, the woman was able to come back. The guy had to pay back all the four tickets in the plane to come back. It's a lot of money that these immigrant people have to pay to fix paper now. You know, when I fix my paper, I think that I pay $300. That's the amount that I pay for everything. Doctor, x-ray, fingerprints, and uh, the fee for the immigration, for the green card. 
Now, I 